Why do Muslims call the other kafir or infidel? One of the words that can have a tremendously negative impact on society is the word kafir, which means non-believer and is commonly translated as infidel. When someone labels someone else as a non-believer, it causes ill feelings in society. However, we need to discuss this issue because people actually give it more weight than it is due. First of all, I would like to address Muslims and tell them that they should never call anyone a non-believer. In fact, in the Holy Quran, non-Muslims were called non-believers only twice. In one of those instances, the angels on the day of judgment say, Oh, you non-believers, make no excuses today. You became non-believers after you had become believers. The second mention refers to the situation when someone tries to make us renounce our faith. Here the Quran tells us to answer by saying, Oh, non-believers, I do not worship that which you worship, nor do you worship the one whom I worship and neither am I going to worship that which you have worshipped, nor will you worship the one whom I worship. You have your religion and I have mine. Other than these two situations, we find that the Quran and the prophets in the Quran in general address non-Muslims by their most beloved titles because we are actually inviting them into our faith. For example, Frequently the Quran says, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, which is another way of saying, O children of the prophet Jacob. In other instances, Abraham addresses his idol-worshipping father by saying, O my father. And Noah called out to his people who were pagans, saying, O my people. So non-believers are addressed by their most beloved titles according to the Quran. All the same, I would like to tell non-Muslims that they should not be offended if they are described in Islamic texts as non-believers because the word kafir or non-believer is not an insult. It is a description of a status. I myself as a Muslim am considered as a believer and a non-believer simultaneously. Whenever there is a certain concept Anyone who believes in it is a believer, and anyone who does not believe in it is an unbeliever or kafir. In order for me to be a Muslim, I must be a kafir or non-believer of sorts. Allah says, So whomsoever disbelieves in the evil one and believes in God has surely grasped a firm handle which will not break. This means that I cannot be a believer in God without concurrently being an unbeliever in the evil one. Of course, Muslims must believe in the existence of the devil. But this verse refers to belief in the sense of taking him as Lord. In another instance, the Quran says, when they saw our retribution, they said, now we believe in God alone and we disbelieve in the idols that we used to worship along with him. The verse states that when people see the truth on the day of judgment, they will become disbelievers or kafirs in what they previously believed. Furthermore, our Lord tells us to be like the followers of Abraham. When in the Quran he says, you have a good example in Abraham and those with him. They said to their nation, we are done with you and what you worship, we have become non-believers in you. So, as I said, to be a Muslim, I must be a non-believer too. The word non-believer is just a description of a state of mind that rejects a certain belief or notion, but is not an insult. Granted, from the point of view of Muslims, people are either believers in Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, or they are non-believers in them. But yet, we should not address them as such since the Quran itself was very reserved regarding the use of this word. Using the same argument to a non-Muslim, I am considered a kafir or an unbeliever in his religion and I find nothing offensive in that. That is why this issue should not be blown out of proportion. To reiterate, neither should a Muslim address a non-Muslim as an unbeliever or kafir, nor should a non-Muslim be offended when he is described as a non-believer in Islam since, in fact, he does not believe in Islam. At the same time, it is inappropriate for Muslim preachers giving sermons to cry out, all Christians are kafirs, 
without first pointing out what our responsibilities towards these kafirs or non-believers are. So what are our responsibilities towards non-Muslims? God Almighty says in chapter number 60 of the Quran entitled Al-Mumtahina, God does not forbid you to be exceedingly kind and just with those who did not fight you on account of your religion or try to drive you out of your homes. So it is actually my duty as a Muslim to be extremely compassionate and just towards non-Muslims and towards those who are considered as non-believers from my religion's point of view, providing that they have not driven me out from my home or waged war against me because of my religion. The Arabic term birr which means being exceedingly compassionate was mentioned in the Holy Quran in regard to two situations, in dealing with our parents and in dealing with peaceful non-Muslims who are living amongst us. But what exactly does bear or exceeding kindness or compassion mean? Well, every Muslim has the obligation to fulfill the rights due to every other Muslim. But in the case of parents, for example, a Muslim should relinquish for the sake of his parents some of the rights that would otherwise be due to him. This is what the Arabic word bir, which is used in the verse to denote exceeding kindness means. So here God is imploring Muslims to deal with exceeding kindness towards their parents and towards peaceful non-Muslims who live among them. On the other hand, the Quran says, but God forbids you from those who fought you on account of your religion and drove you out of your homes and aided in your expulsion. He forbids you from making them your allies and whosoever makes them his allies, it is these who are the transgressors. So that means that as a Muslim, I cannot befriend those who fight me on account of my religion or who aid others in fighting me. And is that not logical? So basically, God is telling Muslims to focus on the relationship between themselves and the other. As a Muslim, ask yourself, are they good to you? If so, then be good to them. If they are virtuous towards you, then be virtuous towards them. God is in effect saying, do not concern yourself with the relationship between God and them. That is his affair, not yours. Whether they believe in his existence or not, whether they worship him or not, should not affect the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims so long as they are not hostile or oppressive towards Muslims. This is a very important point. Yes, there is belief and there is disbelief. But all the same, God commands me to show extreme kindness, care, and justice towards others. As I have explained, the word kafir is not intended to incite animosity or hostility. However, the problem arises when extremists and other ill-informed fanatics misguide Muslims by telling them that anyone who is a kafir or non-believer should be fought. This misconstrued understanding of Islam not only poisons the minds of those unfortunate Muslims who are naive or ignorant enough to believe such claims, but also consequently gives a negative image of Islam to non-Muslims who often believe therefore that Muslims have the right according to the Quran to mistreat. This brings us to the next issue, which is, am I guaranteed to go directly to heaven just because I'm a believer? Actually, Islam is the only religion in the world that guarantees hell to its followers if they do not accompany their faith with virtuous deeds. This takes us to the concept of salvation in Islam. Salvation in Islam is likened to a bird that can soar with the help of two wings. With only one wing, it is sure to fall. The first wing, is faith and the other wing is good deeds. So faith alone is not enough. Faith and good deeds are always associated with each other in the Quran. God always says, those who believe and do good deeds. There must be good deeds in order to reach what is known as salvation or in other words, to attain heaven. Here we must clarify the Islamic stance regarding what is known as the original sin. According to Christian doctrine, the original sin happened, Adam having been tempted by Eve, ate from the forbidden tree. The result of this was that sin entered into the world and that sin consequently became an inherent characteristic of man. In Islam, however, the story is quite different. To begin with, 
Sin is not inherited in Islam, and no man suffers as a result of another man's crime. Actually, in Islam, the very first sin was not committed by Adam, but by Satan. When God Almighty created Adam, he commanded the angels to salute his new creation because this new creation was a VIP, unlike any other creation, as his knowledge was superior to that of the angels since God had taught him the names of everything. Thus, God commanded the angels and all other creatures who witnessed the event to prostrate themselves to Adam. They all obeyed and prostrated themselves to Adam to honor him, all except one, Satan. God reprimanded him for that and asked him, according to the Quran, what prevented you from prostrating yourself to the one that I have created when I commanded you to do so? He answered, I am better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. I am white and he's black. I am European and he's Arab. I am Arab and he's Indian. I am Indian and he's Malay. So the original sin in Islam was not about a fruit eaten from a tree, but was in fact racism, believing oneself to be superior to others because of one's color, sex, or race. The consequence of the original sin in Islam, namely racism, is that races have no place in paradise. This is very evident in God's saying, get out from paradise, it is not for you to be arrogant here. Actually, Satan wasn't arrogant because he was rich, nor was he arrogant because he was handsome. He was arrogant because he was made of another element, fire, fire versus mud. This is the concept which if addressed would improve the world now because most of the world's problems nowadays are due to racism and the belief in racism. When one nation comes down on another nation, bombing its oppressed and tyrannized people with a barrage of bombs and missiles, this is because they believe that these people do not even deserve to live and this is a form of racism. This same concept of no racism in Islam made the abolition of slavery easier because Islam focused on eliminating the root cause of the problem of slavery. In effect, racism had already been eradicated from the early generations of Muslims. When the Muslims first entered Egypt, they met al muqawqis or Kairos of Alexandria, the ruler of Egypt on behalf of the Roman Byzantines. He asked them who they were, why they had come, and asked them to bring forward their leader so that he could speak to him. They brought forward Ubada ibn Salat, who was one of the most knowledgeable among the army that had entered Egypt, as well as being one of the most pious companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was also a black Ethiopian. al muqawqis or Kairos was astonished when he saw him and said, who is this man? I asked you for your leader. They answered, well, this is our leader. He replied, but get me someone I can talk to. Again, they answered, this is the most knowledgeable one among us. What happened to the Arabs? That in a matter of 20 years, they were transformed from being one of the most racist people to suddenly being one of the most accepting of diversity. Note that Arabs used to classify all people into Arabs and A'ajim. A'ajim in Arabic denotes people who do not speak Arabic. But the literal meaning of the word is those who do not speak at all. It is used to describe animals who cannot speak. So in other words, they used to liken non-Arabs to animals who did not possess the faculty of language. Such was the extent of racism among Arabs. Like nearly every uh, other people in the world, the Greeks used to categorize people as Greeks or barbarians. And the Romans used to categorize people as Romans or barbarians. But among the Arabs, such views became obsolete because of the teachings of Islam, which made Arabs regard all humans as equal. Just like the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, all people in the sight of Allah are as equal as the teeth of a comb. So a Muslim must understand that God sent his prophets and holy books for the purpose of upholding justice in the world, upholding justice between all people. God Almighty says, we sent aforetime our messengers with clear signs and sent with them the scripture and the balance of knowing right from wrong so that people may stand forth in justice. All of this so that justice may prevail. So as God's trustee on earth, man must establish and maintain justice on it. And this justice must be upheld whether Muslims are dealing with other Muslims 
or non-Muslims. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was once confronted with the case of a Jew who was being falsely accused of theft. What had actually happened was that a Muslim youth had stolen a bag of food. And fearing that he may get caught, he asked his Jewish neighbor to hold on to the bag of food for him. The Jewish neighbor, however, was oblivious to the fact that the goods were stolen and agreed to keep them safe. Unbeknownst to the thief, the bag had been leaking flour, which left a trail leading straight to the door of the Jew, and which led people to assume that he was in fact the culprit. The Jew told the Prophet that he was innocent and that the young Muslim man was the one who brought the bag to him, asking him to keep hold of it. The Prophet asked for the Muslim youth to be brought to him. His family came and declared that their son had indeed confessed and repented, making a solemn vow that he will never again steal. They implored the Prophet to refrain from punishing him and to instead let the punishment fall on the Jew, since he was, after all, only a Jew. Needless to say, the Prophet would never have done that, but all the same, for our sake, God Almighty revealed verses from above seven heavens to address this issue. He said, We have revealed to you, Muhammad, the book which refers to the Quran. In truth, so that you may judge between people, not between Muslims only, with that which God has shown you, and do not become a pleader for the treacherous. This means that a Muslim must uphold justice among all people in the world. The word kafir has become a swear word, although its original meaning was something quite different. These days, it is flagrantly misused. Therefore, Muslims should refrain from using it when addressing non-Muslims. At the same time, non-Muslims should not be offended by the word itself when it is mentioned in the Quran or in scholarly text. Since in such instances, it is merely cited as the Arabic word meaning non-Muslims. Thank you very much.